Recording in progress. Howdy and welcome back, everybody out there. Glad to, to have everybody tuning in. Welcome back to The Broken Brain. This is Dwight, your host, and I am, uh, I'm always super happy to have any returning guests, returning champions who come back to the program, and I'm very excited today to be joined uh, by Sherry Corbett, coming back again to the program. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Dwight. Thank you so much for having me back. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to, <laughs> to, to have you on and to talk about this as well. I was trying to remember, and I would have looked uh, if I was more professional. I think it was in, wow, was it back in 2021? It was. I, it, I believe the, the last time we spoke was um, two almost exactly two years ago. It was. Okay. Yeah. You're... Well, and so for those who do, who haven't heard that episode, go back and check out that classic episode, uh, July of 2021, <laughs> when uh, uh, Dr. Corbett had come on before. And you you are the director of Awakenings uh, Treatment yes. Center, where you work with uh, complex trauma, PTSD, eating disorders, chronic pain yes. is also a big deal there, right? Of what you guys? Yeah, do. I, I believe the last time we spoke, we talked quite a bit about the intersection between trauma, grief, and loss. Yes, chronic pain, which is really complicated for people, uh, oftentimes to understand. It's one that uh, I know because I know the category it's in. That category of topics in uh, the podcasting gets a lot of listens. I mean, people are really, especially when you. Chronic pain intersects with so many things, sobriety, trauma, yep. all of that that kind of stuff. And and oftentimes it goes along with the trauma that inflicts things that cause PTSD. <laughs> so, exactly. 100%. So yeah. Well, I, I was fascinated to hear what you're doing, uh, the work and the research and things that, uh, that we're going to talk about today uh, has to do mm-hmm. with psychosis that can be related to or triggered by or... Well, probably lots of other relational words we can use. We'll get into those uh, about psychosis, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and wait, did I say psychosis twice? I don't think I said cannabis. <laughs> psychosis. Oh, that's, that's all right. Psychosis that's triggered by psychosis. That's a great topic. <laughs> no, but is triggered by uh, uh, cannabis or influenced or related to cannabis use, right? Yeah. yeah. The last 10 to 12 years, even prior to the legalization in many states, we started to see an uptick in individuals coming for treatment for different psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, who didn't seem to have a history of it in their family, which is unusual. And so we started noticing that we seem to have Um, some common denominators. And one of them was a history of heavy chronic uh, marijuana use. And that at first, that was still sort of a big question mark. And then in the intervening years and during the past decade, it's become more and more obvious. And now there's much more research related to the relationship between the two. It's interesting as things have gone more, as there's been more openness to marijuana-based research, yes. medical marijuana use, recreational, mm-hmm. uh, also being available in, I didn't look it up, but I, I've, several states now have at least medical, if not medical and recreational use legalized. So there's, you got different sides of that coin. When you do research, you'll find things. And it's not always things like, oh, it's, it's awesome. That's not always what you find. Also, a lot of discussions. Yeah. And uh, I had just said as we were starting to record, you know, that uh, many people will take legality as the reason or the one of the big reasons of whether or not they should use something. That's one of there's a lot. Yeah. Of, a lot of people uh, who get off of uh, drug use will dra- gravitate towards alcohol use because you're not unless you get a DUI or commit some crime while you're drunk. You're not going to get mm-hmm. charged for using alcohol, but that doesn't mean that someone with a history of addiction should drink alcohol just because it's legal. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so kind of uh, when things are allowed, we can go, woo, and just kind of <laughs> get excited. And, and so anyway, so balancing this out with what it means for mental health is, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty big. There's, pretty no big. Da- there's no doubt that there are profoundly helpful medicinal uses of marijuana. I don't think anyone that's been paying attention would argue that someone, for example, with um, cancer-related pain 
oftentimes may benefit from using marijuana versus opiates, given the slew of side effects mm-hmm. that from opiates. But that's a very small po- part of the population, of course, and that's not what we're seeing. So uh, really having a focus on this is so important because oftentimes people will come in having had their first, second, or third psychotic break, which is what we call it when someone begins having hallucinations, delusional thinking, really having difficulty staying connected to -to moment-to-moment reality. Mm -hmm. Their family wants to do everything possible to support their care. And so there will be medication, there will be group therapy, individual therapy. But if there isn't a focus on the importance of abstaining from marijuana, particularly the high concentrates of marijuana, the person will frequently be right back in the same situation. The problem with that progression is that the psychotic breaks become more intense and the time it takes for a person to clear, which is what we call it when the delusions and the hallucinations subside, becomes longer and longer. And so we'll often see someone for whom we may be their third or fourth treatment episode. Mm -hmm. Family will confirm that, you know, gosh, last time this happened, she, our daughter, seemed back to herself in two or three weeks. But this time it seems like it's been two or three months. And so this is a, a really important topic for families to have an understanding of. Yeah. Well, let's uh, tell people a little bit about that when you say to clear. What's the definition of like your? So obviously, uh, a psychotic break uh-huh. is a removal from reality in one form or another. And that can be yeah. hallucination. And I guess for anyone out there who's not familiar, right? You can correct me. Hallucination. Uh, is when you see or hear or feel something that is not there that others cannot see, hear, or feel. And delusion is usually yeah. more of an underlying belief. So exactly. Yeah. Delusions are thought based. So they can be um, a par- paranoid thought that someone is being observed, or they can be um uh they can be fear-based or per- per- oftentimes a persecution fear. Whereas, as you said, hallucinations are seeing things that other people are not seeing. Right. Oftentimes with um, cannabis-induced psychosis, we see what we call tactile hallucinations, which is feeling like a crawl feeling on the skin or that something's underneath the skin, something like that. So these are two distinct and separate symptoms, the delusions and the hallucinations. To answer your question, the clearing of them is oftentimes a a subsiding of perhaps thinking someone on the television is speaking to you directly or feeling like that that sense that I just described that something's crawling on your skin. So those may subside. Unfortunately, the uh, delusional symptoms oftentimes become more fixed. So if someone begins to have a fearful thought process that they're being persecuted, for example. Even when the hallucinations subside, oftentimes the delusional process may not subside. Mm -hmm. There's also a third uh, symptom that's very important to discuss, which is anytime a person experiences psychosis, there's often harm to their uh, cognitive processes, their ability to think, not just to think clearly, but to think critically, to think abstractly, to have complex thought. So someone that may have been very bright, whether it was related to academics or or not, someone that was clearly a very, you know, an intelligent person or average intelligence previously will typically experience what is called significant cognitive decline. Um, It's a mouthful, but that's a devastating, devastating. Yeah, it's a very devastating mouthful, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that's a third component. Um, We call the the delusions and the hallucinations, uh, unfortunately, are called positive symptoms of psychosis, where the cognitive decline and the 
the more um, the more subtle symptoms that can be harder to pinpoint are called the negative symptoms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a little bit a of a strange of, dichotomy. Absolutely. A lot of uh, so, people out there may or may not know, like in a lot of psychological or research terms, and we're talking about this, especially behavioral psychology does this too when they talk about reinforcement. Positive means adding – and negative means subtracting, taking away from, right? So exactly. If I'm exactly. losing cognitive yeah. function, it's negative. If I'm seeing something new, that that's a good way. That's a nice spin on a hallucination. I'm seeing something new. Um, yeah. It sounds so positive. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Yeah. But no, it, it's I could be seeing something that is very negative in the way that we would usually use the term negative, but it, it exactly. is a positive symptom because it's appeared. It's a new yeah. Thing. Yeah. So now, that, that <laughs> longevity. Oh, I just wanted to just clarify real quick when you talk about that significant uh, potential cognitive decline that you're talking about that is in reaction to having a more frequent or longer incidence of psychosis tends to exactly to that is what we're talking about going through psychosis more and more which is Exactly. Tri- possibly triggered by the cannabis use is what we're talking about. Gotcha. Exactly. And there's a whole form of treatment for people that struggle with ongoing psychosis called cognitive remediation. And that form of treatment is available to try to mitigate against the effects of cognitive decline. So that's getting a little bit deeper into the weeds. Yeah, absolutely. But there- for all of the different aspects of this. Yeah. And weeds is not a pun necessarily, everybody out there, just so you know. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, that, that went right me. past me. Sorry. No, that was <laughs> you being uh, normal and me being stupid. Uh, <laughs> I, for some reason, I, I it pops in my head. And speaking of uh, compulsions, we can do an episode on compulsive use of humor. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Um, but no, it's a terrifying process. Jumping back into the real seriousness of this, it's terrifying to to have to question one's own reality at the same Absolutely. time. I'm thinking those that have already experienced symptoms of psychosis are definitely more likely to gravitate towards things that would usually alleviate stress, have a drink, smoke mm-hmm. a joint, or maybe even, you know, uh, maybe even with a prescription, depending on where they are and what the criteria are in that state. Um, yeah. To to use alcohol, marijuana, cigarettes, very hard for many people to quit when they have psychotic disorders because for some reason the stimulant of tobacco seems like it helps or they think it does and it yeah. enough that it shortens lifespans. So they're at risk for u- overuse of it, intoxicants and psychoactive substances anyway, right? A- absolutely. That's true. And there's a, a lot of research being done in this area now because what isn't clear – Although it appears that the chronic use of high test, if you will, um, high concentrate THC waxes oils appears to be causing these um, much higher prevalence of psychotic breaks. It really isn't entirely clear if that causality is, is what it appears to be or if people that are vulnerable to psychosis are finding um, marijuana more attractive. So it may be causal in the other direction. Hmm. And so it may just appear um, to be the marijuana, high concentrate marijuana causing psychosis. However, I will say, and this is not research-based, I want to be really clear, that having worked in the field for decades now, we never saw this common denominator prior because waxes and oils were not available. Yeah. And so we, we, we did not tend to see people with no psychiatric history in their family whatsoever, even upon thoughtful, um, um, thoughtful processing of maybe aunt Sally, you know, uncle John, he was never sure. diagnosed. Actually, he does appear to, even when that is a thoughtful process, in my clinical experience, I've never seen this before, Hmm. where almost every uh, individual that's coming in with a psychotic break has a history of of chronically using high-intensity THC. Wow. So there's a lot going on there in that. So uh, from a research standpoint, we're very much at the uh, investigating correlation to to Ex- try to exactly. narrow down causation. 
at exactly the, at the engaged like frontline clinical care level, you're definitely seeing it. So, uh, We're that was, seeing it. And that was my question that I forgot to ask in my mishmash of statements a minute ago was do and, and I think you're answering it there, which is do you see this more prevalent with people who have already had a history? But I, from what you just said, I'm taking that to I mean, uh, not necessarily. It's not necessarily just a yeah, problem for those it, who've already had a break. but yeah. Exactly. And it's very hard to pinpoint because in our area, in Southern California, a lot of the uh, clients that are coming to us are between the ages of 18 and 25 when a person might be experiencing their first psychotic break anyway. But what we're finding is that when we're able to really get honest, when family members are able to really get honest about what their adult child has been doing, there's often been a heavy use of marijuana since early teens or mid-teens. So we are very careful not to try to state a, a clear causality because the research sure. isn't there yet. And there, like I said before, there's a lot of research being done in this area. But, you know, there's a lot of things that we do, uh, varying degrees of research and things that are just kind of standard operating procedure. I mean, people are, are having great results from like ketamine infused therapy. There's been lots of research in that, but when that started, uh, some people, you know, will will say, "Well, that's an off-label use for that. It isn't designed for that." Yeah. It's like, yeah, but that's true for a lot of antidepressants, so we use them anyway. Absolutely. Because sometimes of correlation, and there's other cautions. And I'm surprised, by the way, because I've always been told this: when someone has a problem with ongoing anxiety, one of the first things that they often are told, but unfortunately, often or not, is take whatever amount of caffeine you're you're using and cut it. Uh, you know, significantly yeah. if you can't get rid of it altogether, um, because that contributes to anxiety uh, all by itself, right? So, Ab absolutely, all Often sorts of best practice people, things, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. People with anxiety disorders and sleep disorders are are strongly encouraged. And to your point, Dwight, what is so interesting is that oftentimes people with anxiety disorders are highly attracted to stimulants which is confusing um, on this, on its face. It's confusing. And just as people with depressive disorders are often highly attracted to depressants, like alcohol being the primary one. Yeah. That's interesting. So it, it is interesting. And it's a, it's really an ongoing pro learning process from a research perspective, from a being a frontline clinician because at the end of the day, if someone is attracted to a substance, they are undoubtedly achieving some um, some reaction from that substance mm -hmm. that is helpful. And we need to find, we always are seeking to support that individual mm -hmm. in meeting that need from a healthier standpoint, whether it's physical activity or meditation, or self-hypnosis, or whatever it may be. Well, and yeah, that generally speaking, too, if we view any kind of psychoactive substance, whether it's abusive, whether we consider it problematic or not problematic, if yeah. I gravitate to it, it's always good to see, because the underlying need is generally healthy. It's just how do exactly. we get there, right? <laughs> exactly. Find, I, and it's funny, Absolutely. As you say that, too, it's funny, I just realized, I, I've thought this before on purpose. Uh, that's why I do it. But over the years, I've started uh, investigating for people who tend to gravitate to stimulants, even if they come in for like, uh, d you know, whatever reason, drug and alcohol, you know, kind mm -hmm. of abuse reasons or, or even just something else, but it comes up that they use a lot of caffeine or, or when they mm -hmm. come in and if they use drugs, they go for uppers. Uh, I've started, uh, that immediately is a little note in my head to screen for ADHD. Right. And that's, yes. just a, that's just a little connection that you notice over time is like, well, absolutely uh, stimulant based. So, um, are you absolutely, craving for something yeah. you need? Right. And has a better, uh, there's a better way to get it, uh, usually. Yeah. And, and directly related to this from, from the clinical treatment perspective and wanting always to approach every person with a deep regard of, for respect and compassion. If you're working together, to support 
diminishing the anxiety and a, an individual feels supported, they're going to be much more willing to uh, explore the options that are recommended. So if you're both working toward, like in this example, diminishing anxiety versus, you know, it was a bad thing that you abused this substance. That was a, you were a bad girl or a bad boy. <laughs> But if, as opposed to that, really working together with, you know what, this substance was doing something for you. Right. Ultimately, it's creating consequences or it's diminishing your health in other ways. But let's honor the fact that you were trying to do something productive. You just found a path that ultimately wasn't serving your highest good. And one of the things I was curious about is, do people ever seem to, or do they often seem to pick up on this uh, connection on their own? Because if I'm having a really hard time or, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, you know, maybe I use marijuana here and there, either recreationally or because I think it'll help me. Sure. Uh, but I'm having new bouts of psychosis. I don't know that, I don't know that my first thought would be like, oh, I bet it's the, I, I bet it's marijuana because I don't know, you know that I would like that. You know, Dwight, that's such a great question because the answer to that is really interesting to me. The answer is not only does the person themselves rarely, if ever, connect the dots, but their family members do not. And so we have so many families. I run our, we have a Monday evening um, family support group every Monday night here at Awakenings. And the parents show up, the spouses show up saying, you know, we have to get to the bottom of this. We have no idea what's going on. And thank goodness we don't have to deal with addiction. And I'll often look at them and and then it, it occurs to me, oh, my goodness, they do not have a sense yet that more than likely this was entirely driven by the chronic wax pen, <laughs> by right, the... Right concentrates and trying to educate about that and talk about it is often um, much more contentious than you, you might imagine. Because if, wow. if I have a loved one who's struggling and I'm desperate for them to get help, I'm going to want to hear any possibility. But at least, at, at least at this point in history, marijuana is really being perceived as healthier than other things. It's really, it's, it's all natural. It's healthy. It's not going to give you liver disease like alcohol will and so on and so forth. And so there's some misconceptions that we've really been bumping up against. Mm -hmm. Ultimately the education works because of course, at the end of the day, people just want their loved ones to feel better and to be able to function. Absolutely. Well, and I think that there's a there's a whole little minefield there, isn't there, of different issues that you run into because you've got the uh, you've got the attachment that someone has to hey of the whoa this is my coping skill and that exactly can be, that can be attached to anything I mean you know certainly with addiction but and dependence which you know we can see that even with cannabis use although it didn't uh, traditionally we don't talk about those things as much people think. But you, you, even if you're not as chemically addicted to cannabis, you are definitely addicted to the results of it many times. People can't. Yeah. And, and all the way down to if my doctor says, hey, you know, you know you're know, you pre-diabetic, lay off the sugar. Just think about anybody out there who doesn't quite get maybe like they don't – if you've never been addicted and you don't view that. Yeah. Just look at it. And even if I'm a casual user of marijuana, I'm going to pretend like it was my – I have a conversation with my doctor and then I just walk out the door and I'm fine not having ice cream ever again. Uh, well, right. Yeah, not, not not likely. People usually work. Yeah. <laughs> not likely so. at all. And all of the self-care, in fact, in the 12-step communities – Certainly, that metaphor of diabetes is used frequently mm -hmm. because the notion that someone with diabetes will just sort of snap to it and follow the recommendation is ludicrous because we have powerful emotional connections to the things that give us comfort and to the processes and substances that bring us bring us comfort. How do you respond when because the thing that I see, that people have been happy about clients I've worked with who use marijuana 
and maybe have for a long time. And they may uh-huh. even use it like you would medicinally, even when it was illegal. They'd take a little bit, smoke a sure. little bit, or just or they'd go somewhere where it was legal enough and get gummies or something. And they sure. would, they would use it. And now that it's legalized, they have this feeling of Great. Here's this thing. It, it, you use the phrase better than, right? So it's better than alcohol recreationally. I'd say with some qualifiers, you, sure, there's some truth to that. It's better than opiates. Okay. Probably you can make a case there. Uh, it's better than, now here's a tricky one, anxiety medication. Well, I would only say that a lot of clients I've worked with, and some of them seem to be functioning quite well, do better sure. with that than they do with some antidepressants or anxiety things. And so it's a hard sell. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it really, well, yeah. it really is. And to your point about do clients see the connection to your point about that, there is strong evidence that there's a, there's a powerful rebound effect of anxiety um, when people who are not daily smokers or daily consumers of THC take a break, that there's a very powerful rebound of anxiety. And so that is also true of other anxiolytics. So I'm not, I'm not pointing to THC as a standalone in that, but anytime we're using a substance to calm our anxiety, Mm -hmm. neurologically, the likelihood is that when we stop using that substance, the rebound is going to be extremely uncomfortable. Yeah, gotcha. that can sort of lead into a whole nother conversation, <laughs> but um, but certainly for anxiety, for a lot of mental health issues, the behaviors that we can do that are not medicinal in general are going to be more helpful in a sustainable way. It's interesting when you. You point that out. Yeah, because even just the absence of a period, if it's like I get used to every so often, I sit down and zone with a with a uh, psychoactive substance, even that, mm-hmm. the absence of that will be like, well, this evening I have to put up with all the little irritants and things around me or the yeah. concerns. So even that yeah. would be, feel like a rebound, even if it's not necessarily uh, uh, new or anything. It's just that I'm missing that now. So uh, when people do, is part of this uh, trying to, along with the education, trying to replace that with something else to say, okay, we need to give you other tools so that you don't just keep you, uh, wow, geez, now I know that it might be triggering my psychosis or contributing to it, but I can't, Oh, what am I going to do instead? I still need to go to sleep tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's a complex treatment approach. The experience of having a psychotic episode is terrifying. Yeah. So one of the first things that is important in terms of a treatment approach is the group therapeutic experience so that people can be with peers going through a similar or having gone through a similar experience previously so that first and foremost, they know they're not alone and that help is available. And so that group process is so important. And then um, above and beyond that, we really incorporate and feel that physical movement is critically important. That having been said, different activities resonate for different people. So we don't expect everyone to jump into a yoga class and be thrilled about it. We provide whole variety of different activities so that people can really start to get a sense of what they enjoy. What we always tell clients is at the end of the day, what you are going to continue to do is something that you enjoy. So we provide strength training. We provide more sort of stereotypical um, cardiovascular activity like elliptical and treadmill and cycling and then yoga as well, but all different types of yoga. So that we've exposed clients to a variety of options, mm-hmm. but physical movement for our folks is just critical. Mm-hmm. And then at, what you would expect as well, individual psychotherapy to address thought distortions, uh, family therapy to address what might, what might be going on in the family. Um, it gets, you know, it's never ending complexity. Yeah. So we have to sp- get our arms around as much of that as we can. Right. Absolutely. Well, 
So when uh, when you're talking about the high potency, and it sounds like that's one of the things that has maybe kickstarted all this, is now there's yes, uh, there's like what you know different different sizes and flavors, and now that mm-hmm. it's a product, right? Um, yeah, that you'll find uh, for commercialized products are going to have lots of different variations, and um, yeah, what. What would you consider to be high potency? What are we talking about there? Any any feel yeah. for that? Well, the the general definition of high potency is anything that is twenty percent or above okay. um, THC concentrate. That having been said, there's a huge leap when you leap to the um, the wax and oil concentrates. Those are oftentimes between 82 and over 99% THC. So sort of um, commonsensically, it doesn't surprise me that we see some type of psychological phenomenon. Um, It makes sense to me that that would be the case the same way that when people are drinking beer and wine versus drinking old school moonshine, (laughs) they're going to have different, (laughs) different physical repercussions. Or even more, uh, more higher proof liquors, of course, right. would be, yeah. Yeah. Even if if it comes off the top shelf, so to speak, it's like. Absolutely. Because someone is definitely different than having a beer. Yeah. Your lawn. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So. Certainly, depending on someone's vulnerability, psychologically, it can all become detrimental. But when you're talking about the waxes and the oils and the high concentrates, it, it's just a whole nother situation in terms of psychological ramifications. Yeah. Now, I know that uh, <laughs> when we talk about medicinal, uh, like prescriptive marijuana, or at least a medical card to be allowed to use it. Um, mm mm-hmm. Do you, one of the, a lot of states, I know in the state that I'm in, they do not allow that for simply anxiety, which a lot of people tend to use marijuana f- when they have anxiety symptoms. Uh, but mm-hmm. they do, they do uh, f- approve it for trauma. If someone has a PTSD diagnosis, they're allowed to get it. I'm curious, yes. you know, with, with trauma and anxiety and PTSD being so high, is there, a, what's the risk there? Or is it any greater or lesser than, uh, uh, you know, anybody else, as far as PTSD being something that I like a doctor might issue a card or recommend even, oh yeah, that can be helped by some kind of psychedelics or another one, you know, or or from Mm -hmm. marijuana. Um, Do you see extra risk there or no more than anybody else? No, no more than, no, no more than anyone else. In fact, um, you know, it's often a, a bigger, a larger conversation to discuss with someone, particularly someone that wants to come into a treatment center where it's an abstinence-based facility, that in order to address their symptoms of PTSD, for example, in a in a in a on a path that's seeking resolution, resolution of the symptoms, not a not a medicinal treatment of the symptoms. So for example, if we want to resolve entirely someone's hypervigilance and uh, sort of their extreme startle response, fear of being out in the world, we're actually going to need them to be stone cold sober, if you will. Mm-hmm. And that's very uncomfortable. I mean, if someone's already dealing with all these symptoms, now that doesn't mean that they can't um, be taking a medication, perhaps a sleeping medication or something like that. We can't be softening the symptoms of PTSD and then trying to treat them adequately. And that's, it's a, it's a difficult juxtaposition because you're asking, knowing that in the long run, it's going to be a huge home run it requires a lot of support to keep someone in a place where they're willing to put themselves through that. Right. Yeah. And that's where like a treatment center, I know, you know, is, is, that's yeah. kind of a different thing and can also give people that opportunity because you got uh, in most inpatient stays. In fact, I'll say, you know, I virtually all inpatient stays, if you go to a psychiatric unit on a hospital, they're going to at least evaluate whatever medication you're already on. And in some cases, I've known longer term programs will start 
by under the direction of a doctor and, and psychiatrists and such, mm-hmm. uh, will actually say, how much can we just stop taking and see what happens or wean off of and see what happens? Yeah. Because you come yeah, in with that two can or be... three meds and we don't know if they're right. Absolutely. How do we know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that can be a very productive process when oftentimes people have, tr- they've been trying their get help and they've gone to one doctor and then they've gone to another doctor. And if they've gone to even maybe multiple treatment centers, oftentimes a telltale sign of that is that the list of medications will be just sort of patently ridiculous. And so what you just described, they will call that a medication washout. And oftentimes that washout, not only is it safer to do that with supervision and support, but very productive Because then you can really start from, okay, what is this person's baseline? What does their sleep look like? What does their appetite look like? What does their mood look like when they're not taking anything and they have are are surrounded by support? Because we always want a person to be taking the least amount of medication possible for the benefit that they need. Mm -hmm. So it's not anti-medication perspective by any means, but we want want people to be piling on the side effects, which of course are substantial. So we, it's a, it's a a medication washout. We, we are a fan of that Mm -hmm. and we really support people in doing that. So we really can determine with the right support over an extended period of time, What's the least amount of medication someone can be on to function really well and to feel good? Yeah. You know, it's importantly to feel really solid within themselves. Hmm. So, and once again, it's all very individualized, but when we're talking yeah. about things and even research isn't universal, but it is good to know these trends. Uh, you, I had been reading a little bit of, of, in preparation for this, some of the stuff that you had shared with me. And where is it in here somewhere? There was uh, some indication, some of the research maybe shows that, uh, is it, oh, here we go. Regular use of high potency cannabis, which you just defined for us, uh, Mm -hmm. can can make people up to five times more likely to develop psychosis. And is that, like you said earlier, regardless of their history with psychosis? That's what we're seeing. But again, it's, it's, I, I, we can't put an absolute period on the end of the sentence yet, because it's unclear, even if someone has not had a psychotic break previously, if they may have developed it and they may be more attracted to cannabis um, as a result of that vulnerability. So we don't know the directionality just yet, but when we see this in, um, in younger people, Mm -hmm. we're particularly concerned because particularly in states like California and Oregon and Washington, where recreational use is legalized, a lot of young people are finding access, even if they're not um, of age yet. Mm -hmm. And so it's really treacherous and it's treacherous for for the future of our kids and our teens. Yeah. Yeah. Similar to the, 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 Liquor cabinet at home, right? It's legal, so it's not exactly. hidden or anything. And it might be locked up, but you'd be surprised how good your kids are at getting into things that you think That's are right. Up. One, absolutely, no <laughs> doubt about it. Yeah. Yep. Well, and with that being even a possibility, uh, and, and funny enough, I'm not really hearing a lot of people talking about this right now. You know, you're very plugged into that research world and stuff, So, but I'm just not hearing as many like local general practitioners or even people, uh, therapists, you know, I don't hear a lot of people talking about this. And so I, I wonder if it's a potential landmine like alcoholism, if it's a, if it's a landmine that someone might step on genetically that they don't know is there. And we amplify the number of people that are, uh, uh, that are, that are trying it out or experimenting Mm -hmm. with, with marijuana, you know, uh, you know, let, let's put it this way on a desert Island with no alcohol, uh, you could have a group of people, however big, and there's, we'll never discover who has a predisposition to alcoholism because nobody's drinking. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. And it is at least in, in my clinical experience is it is crystal clear to me that we are seeing young adults having psychosis mm. 
would not have experienced it otherwise. And that's why we're utilizing that diagnostic category, cannabis-induced psychosis. Yeah. Because the common denominator is not occasional use smoking a joint of of uh, leaves. Mm -hmm. The common denominator is smoking wax or oil chronically. By the time someone gets to our office, it's usually a year or more of daily chronic use of smoking wax and oils and so da or dabbing as they say and so that's that's that really strong common denominator that we're seeing and it, it it's terrifying do I use the perfect uh word I think it's it is a landmine and and, and as you also said, until you get to a higher level of care where people are being treated for psychosis, a lot of the clinical community isn't really super dialed into this as a land and families in general are not. Non-clinical populations are definitely not aware of this as a as a concern. When when you've seen that with people, if they stop using, let's say say they stop using cannabis altogether, um, mm -hmm. Does it tend to go away, or do they tend to be like struggle with this and and be diagnosable with psychotic disorders? And you know what, yeah. what happens well, if they stop? <laughs> yeah, well, that's an interesting question because, of course, that is our clinical recommendation for anyone that comes in with psychosis. Now, what we often see is that, and we actually have a number of people that are struggling with this right now, is that if it is truly someone's first episode with psychotic symptoms, they tend to clear more rapidly and the psychosis can really go into the background. Now, there's definitely no longitudinal studies about this. That'll be a sure. whole nother, that'll be a whole nother area of investigation down the road. However, once we have someone who's returning for a second or a third or a fourth psychotic episode, the length of time it takes to clear and the degree to which they're able to clear at all is diminished. Hmm. And like I mentioned, we have, we have a handful of clients right now whose families are just, are just devastated. Their, their loved ones are really not quickly reverting back to their humorous, uh, you know, clear selves. They're really, their affect is blunted. They're fearful. They're responding, as we say, to external stimuli. It's it's not good. So the more psychotic breaks that occur, the longer they hang around, and the less hope there is that they will clear entirely. Wow, it reminds me, and as you're saying that, kind of like uh, concussions. I've known people who you get a yes. concussive disorder, or you get. Uh, they yeah. say the more concussions you get, the more dangerous it is to be more. Vulnerable that is mind. that is completely true. Uh, that's another area that we do a lot of work with at my facility, and I hadn't I hadn't thought of that parallel, but it, that is one hundred percent accurate. It is a great danger when someone who has had a, a significant head injury, if they're vulnerable to having another one, particularly if it's uh, close in time and proximity. It, it's very dangerous. Hmm. It, it's a very similar phenomenon. You're absolutely right. It it makes me think whenever we have discoveries like this, that and this is an ongoing discovery, it sounds like, obviously, because research is just kind of yeah. firing up. It makes me look back and say, how many people have I met over my career or my life mm -hmm. who have psychosis as an ongoing struggle? And nobody ever maybe thought to ask about this, at least not for that reason. I mean, no yeah. healthcare provider has ever been like, yeah, go for it. Chronic <laughs> marijuana use, that's a great idea. But yeah, Of course, uh, yeah. Uh, however, you know, it makes me think like, how long is that connection? Has that connection just always been there? How do we have chronic users who develop psychosis and they were always shunted into this little category over here and we just assume that it's... Oh, Dwight, it's that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, I think the... Pr clinical presentation that we that we've always been sensitive to is sort of the a motivational syndrome mm -hmm. to launch that that was what was considered 
more part and parcel of daily smoking, daily use, you know, someone who just sort of stalls out in their life. But um, it's it's highly possible that people with psychosis were sort of moved over into the thought disorder community Mm -hmm. um, with that assumptive belief that this was an organic process when in fact it was more related to daily use, even prior to the um, distribution of high concentrates, there's so many different layers of vulnerability. So you've got folks that are highly vulnerable because maybe both of their grandfathers had psychosis or, or their grandmothers or whoever, or a, a parent. So um, the different layers of vulnerability change the complexion as well. Yeah. Yeah, when I, it's another thing then to be put into a category that, uh, and this is a problem whether or not you, act, whether or not it's marijuana driven or whatever, but the discrimination against uh, schizophrenia or d- disorders that are identified as psychosis, if that's known, I mean, you start to take a certain identity on. I mean, people still hear schizophrenia. Absolutely. And they're afraid of violence, even though the population of schizophrenics are, are way less likely to become violent than non-schizophrenics. Yeah. Absolutely. Even yeah, when you that's factor a... in that there's less of them. I mean, it's still, there's still less. Yeah, less no, them. you're absolutely yeah. right. That's a very common misconception. Um, you know, it's interesting. It used to, my experience used to often be that that family members, parents in particular, ha- experienced tremendous amount of internal stigma if their loved one had a thought disorder, had schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia or bipolar one with psychosis. And that it was a, it was a, it was much less, uh, much more palatable. Well, maybe this was substance induced. Maybe this was substance induced. But now I'm seeing a variety of people with a, with a range of reactions. There's so much stigma around the more severe uh, levels of mental health disorders. And there's a lot of stigma around substance abuse. Right. So like I even mentioned legal earlier, substance use sometimes, yet that's even legal. Another, even legal. another point of defensiveness people have is like, oh boy, yes. here we go. It's another person telling me the devil weed and reefer madness right. or something like that. Exactly. You know, a lot of young and people watch reefer madness nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I've had, um, a lot of a lot of parents who say this absolutely has nothing to do with smoking. That's ridiculous. This must be, you know, over here. And, and, and you know, it, it's just such a tough call. Yeah. And of course, we can never speak with 100 percent certainty. We have to always wait and see. Yeah. And that's where we'd much rather be able to speak in a black and white context. And we just can't. But even the possibility, just even educating people to say along the same lines, and I think this hopefully can help people get around this uh, uh, fear of judgment or fear of like, oh, you're just another square who's telling me. It's like if we treat it like, oh, well, okay, so let's say that you're using marijuana, you've been using it this long or you use it this much. Even if you consider it to be one of your medications, we're evaluating all your medications. We're trying to say, exactly you know, this one might be, oh, did you know if you take this one and this one together, somehow someone missed that this causes this side effect and your exactly. main symptom is that side effect, you know? Exactly. Well, and going back to your previous um, parallel, you know, it's similar to many years ago, I sort of stumbled over the fact that I had three out of my four grandparents that had diabetes mm-hmm. and I had never known that it wasn't in the sort of the folklore of my family, but I found that out. So I didn't, although I didn't make any radical changes to my day-to-day lifestyle, I very much include that gently, if you will, in thinking, you know, I'm very much going to enjoy a dessert or a a sweet now and again, but I'm probably not going to do it every single night after dinner. And that's why I'm hoping that as we get the information out there, that cannabis can be another driver for psychotic disorders, that we can help people just gently be more thoughtful and be able to be more thoughtful for their siblings, their children, and so on and so forth. Yeah. It's not to create hysteria, but to really help people. Make, really, this is the best way to say it, to make a more informed decision. Yeah. 
No, I, I make an informed decision each time I decide to have dessert as opposed to just uh, not having the information. Well, and when we look at what categorizes something as a problem, uh, if we're talking about this level of high percentage use over a year or more time, mm-hmm. which is really what you're seeing as the biggest correlation, um, there's generally speaking, generally speaking, from just from your mental health and physical like like your body's health, every aspect, mental as well as right. the other part of you, you probably need to look at that. I mean, you know, there's, that, that's not right. something. If you were drinking a box of wine every day, uh, or or you know, a bottle of vodka every other day for a whole year, it's like there's probably something yeah. going on there that I absolutely, should look at, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's not healthy. It's not ideal, right? It's not it's not something. Even if it wasn't also damaging organs, uh, it would be something that'd be like, why do you need to be that checked out? What's going on? Exactly. Exactly. And to that point, oftentimes I find it's helpful, helpful to encourage family members and clients themselves to say, let's take a giant step back here. What is the, what is the bigger picture about? Why is this so important to you? Why do you have so much energy around this? Yeah. And and then maybe try to uh, deconstruct that aspect can be very productive because it engages people's uh critical thinking yeah. why are you doing this i never quite thought about it because if you're stuck in a power struggle you're just busy defending your perspective instead of thinking huh well why am i doing this <laughs> yeah no exactly and even i mean it's good to always kind of have an ongoing question about that i I was thinking as you're saying this in a setting, like take someone like myself who's just in a uh, private practice or maybe even someone in a Mm -hmm. small clinic that all they do, I don't prescribe or anything, but but we do talk to people. One of the thoughts in my mind is how to apply this. If someone comes in who's having especially new or emerging psychosis they've never had before – and uh-huh. as far as I know, I mean, even even their previous diagnosis might just be a mood disorder or generalized anxiety disorder or something like that. Um, oftentimes, well, now there's a new question to ask, right? It's like, well, hey, right. what's your use of marijuana like? Because there, there can be a correlation here. Knowing that means I might ask that question. As a consumer of mental health, that's another thing to say. If me or a family member starts getting that, I might want to be aware. Anybody listening to this, I'm just going to say at this at this point in the game, don't assume that your local therapist knows this or not knows that. Cause I, I've just been learning about it recently. And part of it exactly. was because you're coming on the program and I'm doing the podcast. Sure. So not everybody's doing that kind sure. of thing. And it was, it's not at all dissimilar from, you know, someone who is a heavy alcohol consumer. They're not going to, you know, walk into their brand new therapist office and say, Hey, by the way, you should probably know I, drink a case of beer every night. In fact, right. even our forthcoming, they're probably going to require a little bit of probing to sure. get to, you know, what is one drink equal? Is that four ounces? Is that 12 ounces? Well, <laughs> what is one? Absolutely. And oftentimes I always try to find ways to leave that door open to people to know, even if you told mm-hmm. me that you barely drink, if you ever want to, you know, I would never be disappointed by someone saying, well, I didn't know yes. you that well five sessions ago. And now I'm ready to tell you, I drink myself to sleep every night. I'm right. most therapists are going to be like, awesome. I'm glad you told me. It's like, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, no. it's, it's a, it's a formidable experience beginning a therapeutic process for anyone. I remember uh, reading a piece of research years ago, and it was talking about fetal alcohol syndrome and the risk factors. And one of the things they found was that many people, if they were asked, so so first of all, they found that people, if they were asked, are you drinking while you're pregnant? Many of them mm-hmm. would answer honestly, especially if it was- Oh, interesting. Yeah, especially if it was in a questionnaire written format. Uh, many okay. people are, are, many people, maybe, I don't know. I don't remember the percentage, but many people will sure. answer and say, well, uh, however, when they surveyed to see how many doctors ask that of all of their patients, how many OBs do that, the results were practically none. Nobody's comfortable asking that no question. No kidding. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it was some, it was less than, I mean, it was a very small percentage, less than 5% uh, at least. And uh, you know, the idea that are we comfortable? And I think, to be honest, even in therapy, sometimes when people come mm-hmm. in, it's like, 
uh, do you use any rec- do you use any drugs or alcohol? No. Okay. But when I worked in an outpatient program, I found that you might say, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or, or do you do you use drugs and alcohol or how often do you? But then you'd have to get a little more. Do you use pot? Do you use mushrooms? Do you use whatever you want to call it? You know. Yeah. We wouldn't always yeah, say cannabis and, with our clients, but right. <laughs> but that, and even going. <laughs> Or exactly, or even sort of going in the back door by saying, so what do you do to relax? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that can be a, another way to encourage people to to be more forthcoming. And then you're starting to respectfully honor. You might be doing a variety of things to relax, which is a normal human desire. Absolutely. And reducing that stigma a little bit. And once again, a healthy desire. It's good. It's healthy to relax. Exactly. It's healthy to want to relax. Absolutely. Yeah. Where can people follow this research if they want to learn more and see the emerging stuff? The the bulk of the emerging research is through the NIM, M as in Mary H, the National Institutes of Mental Health. That's the most trustworthy and the most robust source of research. So when I, you know, go online to do a scholarly search, not, you know, what does Dr. Google say this afternoon, sure. <laughs> um, but a scholarly search and, and and the NIMH research is available to the public. And so even if you don't have access to the in- entirety of an article, you'll at the least be able to see the abstract, which includes the hypothesis as well as the results. Right. Dr. Google, by the way, is the only doctor my insurance will cover. So, you know, I so know, that's a hard right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> at it least at a hundred percent. Exactly. But that's, that's fascinating. And NIMH is also like a really good place just for mental health research in general. I mean, yeah, it's a good one if yeah, you're really a, anything that yeah. a person has curiosity about yeah. going fact, to find <laughs> historical research as well as current day. I would say, yeah, I would say anybody, if you're a fan of this program, for example, it wouldn't hurt to have it bookmarked. Uh, you probably would like it. You probably mm-hmm. would find that it was good. Well, this it's very, not only fascinating, obviously interesting and fun to talk to you, but it's also very important information as the world, you know, whether people like it, love it, or hate it, uh, the world is becoming more marijuana positive and aware. But this is yes. an important part of that awareness, right? To say yeah. it's not just a wonder drug that everybody can do as much as you want and it's fine. Um, right. And, you know, I don't know how many people think that. But just, just to be aware of the emerging evidence and emerging research that's done. And also, for anyone out there, if you, your patients, your family member, your, you know, yourself, uh, if you're experiencing any increase in these types of hallucinations or delusions or these psychotic breaks. And, you know, that this might be a good thing to throw into the mix to be aware of like, what is my connection uh, to to this kind of thing? Uh, So when people come on the show, I always like to ask them uh, the first time they come on, I ask them for if they have a charity or anything they want to nominate or share with people. Uh Uh, And you can certainly, if you want to, but the second time people come on, I like to ask them, is there any kind of mentally healthy, or just joy-producing behaviors, actions that you like or that you would give as a little tip to people? Here's a way to increase your emotional mental health today. Absolutely, there is. You know, our culture has gotten so exercise-obsessed that people often think that in order to be doing exercise, that they have to go to a CrossFit box or they need to be riding a bike 100 miles. The number one thing I would say to answer your question is go for a walk. Walk if you're able to walk. Walk in the morning. Get your morning sunlight. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Walk if you have a partner. Walk with your partner. Walk with your kids. Walk with your dog. Whatever that may look like. That if you are, um, if you're able to walk, walk. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just movement. I, I don't know of any singular thing that can bring as much joy and personal comfort as moving one's body. Absolutely. And we do tend to get this kind of all or nothing perspective. This, uh, yeah. It's, it's the other side. It's it's pros and cons of having a world where we can find so much information. I can easily find all yeah. the things I should be doing, but we forget that some is better than none. Right. And even yeah, and, and good, right? even a small amount, or you know, some people 
you know, really enjoy working in their backyard or really enjoy decorating their, their homes. And all of that can be movement. Cleaning house is a lot of work. <laughs> and so if someone every Saturday, if they know they're going to clean their home, that's a workout. And I don't think in our culture of extreme um, activity that people really give themselves any credit for that or, or put the onus on themselves when really they could walk around the block and their dog and their partner might enjoy it as well. <laughs> well, tell people as well, where can they find you and follow your work and what you're doing with Awakenings with other? other sure. Things? Well, Awakenings Treatment Center is online at awakeningstreatment.com. And our blog and our social media outlets are available from that site, awakeningstreatment.com. And the, our information is available there. All of our blog posts are there. We have some uh, video information as well. So that is the best place to find what we're doing. Physically, we're located in Southern California, about 30 minutes north of Los Angeles, depending on uh, time of day. We're in Agora Hills. We're right off a uh, major freeway. And our clients come to us from the local area and from all over the country. We typically also have a small cohort of international clients as well. So people come to us from all over the world. We're a science-based facility. And so oftentimes people... We're oftentimes what folks call the last house on the block, if you will. They've been to several other facilities and they're still struggling with whatever it is that they're dealing with. And they want to dive into it in a in a more science-based manner. Gotcha. Gotcha. And excellent. And that's really the wave of the future is, is being more research informed and less. I mean, we, we've always, uh, I think, in the corner of the industry that deals with some of these things. Uh, we've been kind of like, here's what we think works. And just, I've loved in the last 10 to 15 years, especially I've seen a real uptick in, well, what does work and what, what should we, exactly. stop doing what should we do more of, or start doing that we never thought of. So exactly. We, we do a lot of internal research. So we're every month, every year we're identifying is what we're doing working hmm. in an objective and measurable manner. Different from calling someone three months after they discharge saying, are you still sober? You know, um, but we're really finding out about the mental health components and what is continuing to improve at a 30, 60, 90 and one year uh, milestones so that we can really identify what what is working and what isn't. Yeah. So we're making improvements as well. It's a nice follow-up too. If I know I'm getting those calls and that you care, I could, I'd be more, more likely to say, yeah, I'm having a hard time. Oh, well, maybe I should get some more treatment, you know? Absolutely. Uh, we do not, have an yeah. alum and we have an alumni support system that is a big part of what we do. It's yeah. very special for, again, for people to not feel alone. Very cool. Well, thank you again for sharing. Um, everybody out there, make sure to you know, go check into these things, follow up and and use this information. I, I guarantee many people out there, if you think about it, there's probably someone or somewhere in your life that this is going to be useful knowledge as you hear. Uh, keep you know, just just keep your eyes and ears open when people are having issues with psychosis. We should all be aware that this is one risk factor that's there. Um, for those of you that are listening, once again, thank you for listening. You can always get involved with the program in multiple different ways. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash broken brain, uh, or you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash broken brain as well to contribute or to become involved with the program. Uh, you get some special bonus things like the the video of all the interviews, this one included, that usually don't pop up anywhere. You can watch that if you choose, and also bonus episodes. One, uh, Also, one thing, I'm looking at my little calendar. I think this will be out before then. Uh, on August 31st, I'm going to be having uh, the Broken Brain Observance of International Overdose Awareness Day, and we'll be doing a live broadcast like it did last year. It'll be uh, it's a it's about a four or five hour long uh, live broadcast with some different guests and segments and things. So tune into uh, the to hear to listen to, for that and also tune into the social media. There will be 
uh, a little bit before. There'll be a link dropping, and anyone who is a listener or is watching is welcome to click on that link and join the program as well that day. So that's uh, an exciting thing that I'm really trying to get ready for and um, excited to, to be able to do. And you, of course, uh, Sherry, you're invited as well if you want to be part of that. Thank <laughs> you. you. I will, thank you. I will be there. Thank you for letting me know about it. Well, thanks again for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.